had a really good question come in the mailbag today, and this is the right kind of question to ask. When talking about Cobb-Douglas utility functions and the exponents and how they're represented, there are a lot of textbooks that insist that you should represent a Cobb-Douglas utility function this way. u equals x to some exponent times y to 1 minus that exponent so that the sum of the two exponents always equals 1. And some professors might insist that the exponents always have to e equal 1. And in a video I did about the shortcut rule for marginal rate of substitution for a Cobb-Douglas utility function, sometimes I don't make exponents add up to 1. Here's the more general form of a Cobb-Douglas. Utility equals some constant times x to any exponent times y to any exponent. There really isn't a constraint on what these two exponents need to be. They just need to be set so that they represent the preferences of somebody. So the question, do the exponents always have to add up to 1? The answer is no. But you can, for any Cobb-Douglas utility function, if the exponents don't add up to 1, you can always force them to add up to 1 without losing anything. Let me show you how that works. The most important thing when it comes to analyzing choices of an individual is not the utility function. The most important thing is actually the marginal rate of substitution. That's really where the action is. And the shortcut rule, I'll put a link to that video in the description below, but you'll get the idea here as well. The shortcut rule is marginal rate of substitution is just a times y over b times x. Now why that is, is marginal rate of substitution is the marginal utility of x divided by the marginal utility of y. And when you take the derivative of the utility function, partial derivative with respect to x, you get cax to the a minus 1 times y to the b. When you simplify all this, what's going to happen is you see that constant is going to go away. What that tells us, if you believe me, that the utility function doesn't really matter, it's marginal rate of substitution that matters for predicting the choices somebody makes, what we see is that that constant here doesn't really matter, so we don't need it. It's unnecessary, and we can just get rid of it. Now, what we're also going to see is that those exponents, we can force them to add up to 1. When we simplify the rest of this, you see the a there, you see the b there, and when we simplify the x to the a minus 1 divided by x to the a, you just get x to the 1 in the denominator, right, because it's going to be x to the minus 1. We get a in the numerator, we get b in the denominator down there, and then similarly, with y to the b divided by y to the b minus 1, it's going to be y to the first power. That's where the shortcut rule comes from. Here's just a couple things you have to make sure you understand. Number one, utility is just a concept. Utility isn't a real thing that exists in the real world. Utility is a modeling tool, and the idea here is the number we use to represent utility doesn't matter the only thing that matters is that bigger numbers are assigned to things that people prefer more. So the actual number we get for utility doesn't matter. And again, think back to that constant we were talking about. We can take utility and multiply it by any number. It doesn't change the underlying preferences that are represented. So instead of calling one util, we could call it a million utils. And as long as we consistently transform that, it doesn't matter. When you solve a utility maximization problem, here are the two equations that matter. Marginal rate of substitution equals the price of x over the price of y. And what this equation does is it guarantees that the slope of an indifference curve is equal to the slope of the budget line. All right, we're getting a tangency there. And the second equation is just the budget line equation itself. That's the constraint. It makes sure that we don't spend more money than we actually have. All right, so we're getting to the final answer here. So since the number for utility doesn't matter, and we can get rid of that constant, here's something else we can do. Whenever we have a utility function that has arbitrary exponents for A and B, we don't need the constant we've seen, what we can do, since all that matters really when you get down to it, when you calculate that marginal rate of substitution, is the ratio 
of a to b, here's what we can do. We can take the top, that a exponent, and we can multiply it by anything. Call it a constant c. As long as we multiply the bottom exponent by the same constant c, we see that what we get when we look at the ratio of a over b in this marginal rate of substitution function, that constant really doesn't matter. It's really just the ratio of the two exponents, a divided by b times how many y and how many x we get. It's that ratio that matters. So in this previous video when I was talking about the shortcut rule for marginal rate of substitution for a Cobb-Douglas, I had a utility function like this. Utility equals x to the point 0.7 times y to the point 0.1. This violates this rule that a lot of your professors will have said that, look, those exponents need to add up to 1. It should look like this, x to the a times y to the 1 minus a. Hey, we can put it into that format. How do we do it? Well, if you want 0.7 plus 0.1, if you want to transform those, so that when you add them up, they equal one. Right now, they don't. What do we need to do to both of those exponents so that when we add them up, they equal one? Well, we need to divide everything by 0.8, and then we see that if we have 0.7 over 0.8 plus 0.1 over 0.8, we're gonna get one, right? Because 0.8 over 0.8 equals one. Or in other words, we can change this to 7 eighths plus one eighth. As long as we change those exponents, we get it to be in that form that your professor or your textbook may have talked about. So u equals x to the seven eighths times y to the one eighth will represent the same preferences because the marginal rate of substitution, when you calculate either one of these, what you're going to end up with is that the marginal rate of substitution equals either 0.7y over 0.1x, and that equals 7 eighths y over 1 eighth x. Do the math. This is going to be 7y over x. This, similarly, is going to be 7y over x. The marginal rate of substitution is the thing that matters. Now let me demonstrate this. The only thing that's going to change is that the values we assign to different utility levels are going to change a little bit. So here's a graph of the indifference curve map for this original utility function, x to the point 0.7 times y to the point 0.1 here. And we see the indifference curves for 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 utils, etc. Right, going from smallest to largest up here. So this would be the indifference curve for 10 utils right there. If we change the utility function to be x to the 7 eighths times y to the 1 eighth, or x to the 0.875 times y to the 0.125, however we want to write this, we see these are the same indifference curves. They represent the same preferences, right? This is what we used to call a utility of 10 up here. Indifference curve for utility equals 10. Well, this tells us that this person would still be indifferent between those same combinations, but now we're going to call it utility equals 17.8. Look at all these combinations here. They're going to be exactly the same combinations that this person is indifferent up here with this utility function. And when we solve these two equations for two unknowns, marginal rate of substitution equals the ratio of the prices and the budget line, that marginal rate of substitution that goes in right here it's going to be the same whether we represent marginal rate of substitution as 0.7y over 0.1x or as 7 eighths y over 1 eighth x. So the trick is, if you ever want a utility function to look like this, and it doesn't, then all you have to do is take the exponents that you see, a and b, and divide both of those exponents by the sum of a and b. So if you do this, u equals x to the a over a plus b times y to the b over a plus b. It's easy to see here that a over a plus b 
plus b over a plus b is going to equal 1, or a plus b over a plus b. That's how you can convert any utility function representation into this standard form that a lot of professors like. It's just the simplest way to do it. And in a lot of textbooks and in a lot of professors' minds, if this is the simplest way to represent it, why not always represent it that way? Here's my answer. Cobb-Douglas functions are also used to analyze production. So instead of this being utility equals this, it might be quantity of output equals this. So in a microeconomics class, you are generally going to both study maximization of utility and maximization of output or minimization of costs, two ways of looking at the same question. So when I teach maximization of utility, since I do that first in my course, I always introduce the fact that this is the most general way to write a Cobb-Douglas function, and that sometimes we use them for utility, sometimes we use them for production. And when we analyze utility, you can simplify this. You don't have to write that constant because it doesn't really do anything. And in addition, you can simplify these exponents because for any given utility function, there are a lot of different ways you can write a utility function that give you the same marginal rate of substitution. Let me just give you one more example here. So for this utility function we were looking at before, x to the 0.7 times y to the 0.1, there are a lot of ways we could write that, right? We could add any constant at the beginning, but in addition to that, the utility function u equals x to the 7, y to the 1, or x to the 70, y to the 10, these functions will all result in exactly the same marginal rate of substitution because when you divide those exponents, 70y over 10x, you're just going to get that same ratio of 7 to 1. If you have any additional questions about this or if there was something about my explanation here that wasn't clear, please let me know in the comments and I will try to straighten it out. But I hope this has helped you understand why in some textbooks and some professors, they will insist on writing utility functions in this simplest possible way, but then sometimes people won't. Berkey Academy signing out. Keep those great questions coming, and as always, I wish you the best of luck in all of your studies.